We three kings of Orient are Bearing gifts we traverse afar Field and fountain, moor and mountain Following yonder star Sing that again We three kings of Orient are Bearing gifts we traverse afar, field and mountain, moor and mountain, following yonder star. Oh, star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright. Westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. Good morning. Would you stand with us as we sing? Breaks the power, who breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder. you've done for me who brings our chaos back into order who brings our chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who 
conquered the grave. Oh, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. for me Amen. Let's continue to worship together.
little tangled up. You may be seated. Good morning. My name's Sean. Welcome to Central Park Church. Happy New Year. There are two symbols up at front this morning. We have the Advent candles here on the one side and the baptismal font on the other. Both are symbols of God doing something new, which is fitting on this first Sunday of the year. The Advent candles here remind us and help us to anticipate the coming of Jesus into this world as a human, as this great, great symbol and act of love on our behalf. And on the other side here, we have the sacrament of baptism, which we get to celebrate this morning, not only for Wesley, but also remembering our own baptism, symbolizing our passage through death and into life. So hear these words from Isaiah 43. Now this is what the Lord says, He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me, there is no Savior. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. This is the word of the Lord. Even today, God continues to do new things. And so we remember and celebrate the presence of Jesus in the world, even today, and our own death and resurrection as we celebrate baptism. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you alone are worthy of all of the praise and honor in glory, because apart from you, there is no Savior. And we thank you that even still today, you are doing something new. You still make streams in the wasteland, and you still invite and welcome us into your presence. And you still tell us that we are yours, that you love us, and that we are washed clean. We give thanks to you and praise your name. Amen. I'm glad that you made it to worship this morning. I'm Pastor Kevin, and uh, very happy to, uh, to welcome you to worship this morning, especially those who have come as guests today for the new member in baptism. A few things to draw to our attention as we come together as God's people this morning. Um, we have uh, come to the beginning of a new year and to the end of the season of Advent Christmas in a, in a way, and uh, today is the last uh, Sunday we'll use the Advent wreath, and this week we're going to take down the Christmas decorations, uh, starting a new uh, series where we're going to dig into baptism and church membership and all those kinds of things over the next few weeks, so I invite you to be a part of that. Um, the undecorating of the sanctuary is going to happen on Wednesday morning this week, 9 a.m., uh, come here to the sanctuary if you're able to help to undecorate and put things away so they're ready for uh, Christmas at the end of this year. That would be wonderful. We'll take all the help that we can get not on Wednesday morning, 9 a.m. Um, also Wednesday this week, uh, community night starts up again. Uh, dinner at 5.15, or 5.30 rather, and then classes at 6.15. There are some uh, new Bible studies that are starting, small groups uh, that you can partake in. There's the, the class that I'm going to be doing is on the book of Ezekiel. We're going to dig into an Old Testament book this time and see what God has to share with us there. Um, the, uh, the men's group is going to be starting a study of the book of James uh, using a video resource by Francis Chan. Uh, once again, so that study is starting new. It's a new opportunity to jump in there. 
And uh, Max is going to be leading a study that he's inviting uh, students and adults to. So I want to have a kind of a mixed group of uh, students and adults coming together to study a book by uh, Dan Kimball called um, How Not to Read the Bible. It's a very... Uh, uh, a book that helps us to see and understand what it is that God intends for us to know from Scripture. And so I would encourage uh, those of you who are looking for a place to plug in on Wednesday night, uh, students sign up through adults, uh, find a spot. Um, Max's group is going to meet in the gathering place, and the other two groups in the spots uh, where they have met before. So Wednesday night represents a good opportunity to get plugged in on Wednesday night if you have not up to this time. So um, as we have come together this morning to, uh, to gather together around the baptismal font, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Lord God, I want to give you thanks uh, for the sacraments that you have given to us. Because when we come together around the Lord's table or around the baptismal font, we have a sign and a seal of the things that you are doing in and through our lives and within our community. And so we're thankful this morning that we can celebrate um, church membership and celebrate the sacrament of baptism. We just thank you for all that it means and for the things that you teach us and that you share with us in the sacrament of baptism. And so we pray for your blessing upon what we do here. We pray that you'd be honored and glorified and that your message would be proclaimed as we share together today. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. As we uh, get ready to celebrate uh, membership in baptism, I'd like to invite uh, the Reverend Dr. Uh, James Mead, or better known as Wesley's grandfather, uh, to come up and to share together. Uh, we're going to participate together in the sacrament of baptism and the membership. Um, just glad to have you here today you. To, to assist with that. So. so hear these words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember that I am with you always to the very end of the age. Hear also these words from Scripture. There is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Baptism is the sign and seal of God's promises to this covenant people. In baptism, God promises by grace alone to forgive our sins to adopt us into the body of Christ, the church, to send the Holy Spirit daily to renew and cleanse us and to resurrect us to eternal life. This promise is made visible in the waters of baptism. Water cleanses, purifies, refreshes, sustains. Jesus Christ is living water. Through baptism, Christ calls us to a new obedience, to love and trust God completely, to forsake the evil of the world, and to live a new and holy life. Yet when we fall into sin, we must not despair of God's mercy, nor continue in sin, for baptism is the sign and seal of God's eternal covenant of grace with us. The shepherding elders at Central Park Church have welcomed Paul and Molly, who have appeared before them and made profession of their Christian faith. And we're going to ask them now to declare their faith before God and Christ's church that we may rejoice together and welcome them as brothers and sisters in Christ. So Paul and Molly and Wesley, if you'd come on up to the front here. So Paul and Molly have been around for a while um, and have been a part uh, of the life of Central Park Church. And now they are uh, being received as, uh, as members here. Uh, Paul is transferring from the First Reformed Church of Waupun, Wisconsin, and Molly is uh, transferring from Trinity Reformed Church of Orange City, Iowa. And we're glad to have you folks here for this. So, And also, they're presenting Wesley uh, to be baptized this morning, so uh, let's not forget that part. So let's stand together and confess what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. So Paul and Molly, beloved of God, I ask you before God and Christ's church to reject evil, to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, and to confess your faith of the church. Do you renounce sin and the power of evil in your life and in the world? Who is your Lord and Savior? Will you be a faithful member of this congregation and through worship and service seek to advance God's purposes here and throughout the world? Do you promise to accept the spiritual guidance of this church, to walk in a spirit of Christian love with this congregation, and to seek those things that make for unity, purity, and peace? Paul and Molly, do you promise to instruct Wesley in the truth of God's word, in the way of salvation through Jesus Christ, to pray for him, to teach him to pray, and to train him in Christ's way by your example, through worship and in the nurture of the church? People of Central Park Church, do you promise to love, encourage, and support Paul, Molly, and Wesley by teaching the gospel of God's love, by being an example of Christian faith and character, and by giving the strong support of God's family in fellowship, prayer, and service? If so, answer, we do. Paul and Molly, remember that you are baptized. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit, marked as God's own forever and called to follow Christ in mission. Defend, O Lord, these your servants with your heavenly grace, that they may continue yours forever, and daily increase in your spirit more and more, until they come to your eternal kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Wesley James, for you, Jesus came into the world. For you, he died and conquered death. All of this, Wesley, Jesus did for you, though you knew nothing of it yet, O little one. We are able to love because God first loved us. Wesley James, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Child of the covenant, in baptism you are sealed by the Holy Spirit, marked as God's own forever, and called to follow Jesus Christ in mission in the world. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, Look with kindness upon Molly and Paul. Let them ever rejoice in the gift you have given them. Grant them the presence of your Holy Spirit that they may bring up Wesley to know you, to love you, and to serve you. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only King and Head of the Church, Paul, Molly, and Wesley, are received into the visible membership of the Holy Catholic Church and Central Park Church and are engaged to confess Christ and to be God's faithful servants until their life's end. Paul, Molly, and Wesley, we welcome you uh, into Central Park Church in this body of believers, and uh, we join in giving thanks and praise to God for you and glad that uh, together we are serving God in mission in this place. So could you uh, express a, a, your welcome to Paul and Molly and Wesley here this morning? Thank you very much. As we celebrate the, the baptism of this child and the welcoming of uh, Wesley into this community of faith, uh, we <clears throat> sing together, uh, What Child Is This? A reminder of who Jesus is as he has come into this world. Let's stand and sing this familiar Christmas carol.
What child is this? What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch are keeping. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. So bring him incense, gold, and myrrh, compares and king to own him the king of kings salvation brings let loving hearts enthrone him raise raise a song on high the virgin sings her lullaby joy joy for christ is born the babe the son of mary this this is christ the king whom shepherds guard and angels sing haste taste to bring him lord the babe the son pierce him through the cross he bore for me for you hail hail the word made flesh the babe the son of mary amen you may be seated kids you can head out to central park kids A multitude, a multitude, a multitude. And suddenly there's with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest. As our bumper video shows, uh, we have been walking through some of the very familiar carols of Christmas and thinking about the stories behind them, of uh, how they were written, and also the scripture passages, the, the nativity stories that they represent. Today, we are at the last of that series. We're looking at the song, We Three Kings of Orient Are. Uh, that song, that Christmas carol, was written in 1857 by John Henry uh, Hopkins, Jr., uh, John Henry Hopkins was a very busy man. He was a rector or pastor of Christ Episcopal Church in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And he was also a music teacher of, at the uh, General Theological Seminary in New York, New York. And so he had two roles that he was carrying on at the same time. And, and uh, in 1857, he was coming to the end of that particular role. And he, uh, at the seminary, they were doing a Christmas pageant of some kind, and he wrote this song for that pageant. And uh, at the end of the service this morning, we're going to sing We Three Kings, all five verses and, and the chorus, those parts of it. And I want to you, give you a little cue or clue as to how, that, uh, how the song unfolds. There are five verses uh, to the song We Three Kings. The first and last verse are sort of general uh, verses of praise to God, but the central three verses uh, are intended to be solos by three men, three male voices, to represent the three wise men, uh, Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. And uh, each of them, you'll notice, is in the first person. Uh, the second verse is, Born a king of Bethlehem's plain, gold I bring to crown him again, king forever, ceasing never, over us all to reign. So the, 
the, the way that uh, John Henry Hopkins uh, intended this was that all, there would be three male voices. They would sing the first verse together, and then one of the men would sing, As Caspar, you know, I gold I bring, and then verse 3, uh, Melchior would sing, Frankincense I o- to offer I have, and Balthazar singing verse 4, Myrrh is mine, it's bitter perfume. And so they're each representing the gift that they bring uh, to, into the presence of the Savior who was born. And then the last verse is, glorious now, behold him arise, king and God and sacrifice. Um, So again, a summary verse at the end, looking to Jesus' resurrection from the dead, his presence uh, with the Father in heaven. The chorus goes, um, O star of wonders, star of night, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. And so making that connection between the light of the star that was the the, uh, the thing that called them to search for Jesus and to the perfect light that Jesus himself is uh, as he was welcomed into this world and still continues to be the light of the world uh, for us as well. Uh, one of the, the interesting things that this particular song does is that it ties the, the different gifts, the gold, frankincense, and myrrh to different roles of Jesus in his life. Uh, first of all, we notice that he is king and he needs to be worshipped with gold uh, with, the, with the riches that we have. And so ver- the verse about gold uh, says that he's worthy of our, wor- our praise as king. Uh, frankincense is for one who is divine. Frankincense is used as incense in worship. And so it points to the divinity, the deity of Jesus. And it reminds us of God being near, God being with us um, as Jesus was here upon this earth. And then myrrh is something that was used when a body was prepared for burial. And so it looks ahead to Jesus' death and the cross and his burial and um, it becomes a part of his sacrifice. So in the fifth verse where it mentions that he is king and God and sacrifice, it's pointing out these three different things that were part of Jesus' life. That he is the king, the king of kings, that he is God with us, that he is deity here walking upon this earth, and he is also the sacrifice, the one who died on our behalf. And so Jesus Christ is praised for all of those things that he is. And so later on when we sing that song, I want you to think about those parts and pieces of it and uh, sort of put that together, sort of follow through with the, the plan of the carol as, uh, as we sing it to, as God's people and allow that to bring our worship uh, into the presence of God this morning, uh, thinking about who Jesus is. But the question whenever we sing together a song, um, a Christmas carol, is to ask, is that exactly what the story says? Listen to the words from Matthew chapter 2 of the story and notice if there are any differences between the the song and what we find in this passage of Scripture. Matthew chapter 2, beginning of verse 1. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. When he had called to gather all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least of the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen when it arose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So did you notice any difference between the Christmas carol that we sing and the story that we find in that passage of Scripture? One of the things that you probably notice is that in the passage they are not called kings, they are called magi. Magi were astrologers, they were wise people, people who studied and uh, were advisors within the royal court. And uh, often... uh, 
came up with things that they wanted to know or needed to know by looking at the movement of the planets around them. That was one of the, the main things that they focused on. But then they were people who were in the royal court giving, giving wisdom and advice to those who were making the decisions in their time. So very trusted advisors within the court, but they were not kings. Uh, the calling them kings came about in the third century uh, when these wise men or magi began to be called kings um, as, as within the church of Jesus Christ. We also notice in this passage that there are not any names that are given. Uh, no, none of them have the names of Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. Um, those names came about in the 8th century where the church began to assign names to these wise men who were there. And in the Western church, we assume that there were three wise men because there were three gifts given, gold and frankincense and myrrh. But in other traditions, in the Eastern church especially, they say that there were 12 wise men who came to honor and to worship Jesus. And we don't know. The passage doesn't tell us how many of them there were uh, when they came to worship Jesus at all, but they come with a gift that they, that they are bringing. And we also notice in the passage that we have no uh, instruction about what these, different goal, what these different gifts mean. Gold and frankincense and myrrh are not explained in the passage as to how they are significant. They are simply given as gifts. All three of them were given as gifts that were worthy of a king, and um, I believe that they were probably used <clears throat> by Mary and Joseph as they fled to Egypt and then eventually back on to Nazareth once again, that there was the means that God provided for them to be supported in the, the running and the traveling that they needed to do. But all of that understanding of what these things might mean or what they could point to are things that we've thought of along the way. And they're probably true. They definitely point to those kinds of things and draw them to our attention. And so the, story, the song, We Three Kings, gives us more to, to think about or, or take some of the things that have come up in the tradition, the history of the church, to, to add to the story. But this morning, let's take just a look at what it is that um, is happening in this story and see what it encourages of us as we draw close to Jesus as well. The first thing that I want us to notice here is that uh, the wise men seek diligently. These wise men, these magi, seek diligently when they're looking for Jesus. The passage, frustratingly for us, does not give us a lot of <clears throat> clue or instruction about what this star was. We'd love to know exactly what it was that they saw. You know, what part of the sky did they see this star? Was it something that appeared just for a short time, or was it there for a long time? And there have been different conjectures about what the star might have been. You know, was it a comet? Was it a couple of planets coming together in an unusual way? Was it a, a configuration of stars that only comes around every so many hundreds of years that they would not have recorded before? We do not know exactly what they saw. But they saw something in the stars that let them know that something unusual was happening. And they put that together with prophecies that were being shared uh, among the Jewish people. You see, these wise men were from, <clears throat> from the land of Persia, from Babylon, uh, in that particular area, and there still were Jews that were living in that region uh, that had been there since the time of their captivity. And the, the things that the Jews believe about God and the, the prophecies that they were sharing and experiencing had been spread among many different peoples. In fact, in the first century before Jesus came, there was kind of this hope and expectation that there was going to be a king who would come up from the land of Judah that would bring about a time of peace and prosperity. You know, the Roman Empire was ruling the world at that particular time of crushing nations and holding people down. And so there was this hope that was rising that there would be this king that would come in fulfillment of the prophecies of the people, of the Jewish people, that would bring about peace and prosperity uh, in that time. And so they put the star in the sky together, the prophecies of the time uh, that were being circulated and said, something is happening. A king of the Jews has been born and we need to go see. And so they planned, they prepared, probably a whole entourage of, of, uh, of servants and of others who went along with them, perhaps three of these wise men, maybe as many as 12 of them. We have no idea how many made the journey. It's a 900-mile journey from Babylon to Jerusalem. Surely it took them several months uh, to make that journey and, of course, all the preparations that came. And we know from their conversation with King Herod that it was two years from the time they first saw the star in the sky until they came there to that place. A lot of preparation, a lot of time taken to make that journey to come to the place where Jesus was. They were diligent about their seeking of him. When they come to Jerusalem, they assume that the child of the king 
is going to be in Jerusalem. That's the capital city, after all. And so as they come into town, they assume that everyone is going to know that the king of the Jews has been born. And so they begin to ask on the streets where this child is. Where is the king that was born? But the people don't know what they're talking about. The rumors spread through town, and as people realize that they are asking about a king that they don't know about, they begin to fear their own king. Herod is the king at this particular time. Herod the Great, he is called, and that's what he wants to be known as. Herod uh, the Ruthless is more what he is. Uh, Herod has even been known to put members of his own family to death. He rules with an iron fist. Uh, he is the one who builds cities in this particular area to, uh, to build a name for himself and to help to pacify the people that he has under his control, under his thumb. Herod the Great wants to make sure that everything remains under his control as well. And so as people hear these questions about a new king of the Jews that has been born, they are not filled with joy and celebration. They're filled with horror and with fear. They are disturbed because of what they're hearing. It must have been a surprising thing for these wise men, for these magi. As they came into the city of Jerusalem, began to ask, where is the, the king of the Jews who has been born? And to have people be puzzling and then concerned, troubled, and afraid. Well, eventually they come before King Herod. Herod asks some questions about what they have seen. And, and then we notice what Herod does. Herod calls together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law. Notice he doesn't just check with a few of them. He says he calls all of them together. He gathers the whole Sanhedrin together in one place and asks him where the Messiah is to be born. Notice, notice that Herod is the one who makes the jump from this king of the Jews to the Messiah, the expected one that they're waiting for. Perhaps the one that Herod was afraid of, someone who might come and challenge his throne or the throne of his family that was coming after him. Still, the wise men press on. As the word goes to these leaders of the Jewish people, they say, well, the Messiah is to be born in Bethlehem. They quote from the prophet Micah, but for you, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Bethlehem, that's the place. So Herod quietly tells the wise men to go there to Bethlehem to find the child. And so as they set out on their way, the star again appears for them and lets them know that they are in the right place and they come to that place in Bethlehem, finding the house where he is to worship Jesus. They have sought diligently for him. They are seeking carefully. They're not letting any obstacle, any trouble, any difficulty, any hesitation stop them from the task that they have at hand. They are diligent as they come to seek Jesus. And so maybe this is a opportunity for us to stop and to think about how diligently we are seeking after Jesus at this point in time. Today we stand together on the very first Sunday of a brand new year. It's an opportunity for new beginnings and new starts. Uh, what are the things that we are seeking to do this year, ways that we might engage in seeking Jesus Christ? You know, we, of course, we've got all the scripture. We know so much more about, about Jesus from the New Testament and the Old Testament, his life. We know so much more than these wise men ever did or ever could have. But if so, sometimes we become complacent in our knowledge of Jesus. But these wise men model for us diligently seeking Jesus, looking for him, pressing on to know who he is and to, to worship this king of the Jews who has been born. And so as we begin this new year, should be with a, a plan or a thought. How are we going to dig more deeply into Scripture this year? How are we going to pursue knowing who Jesus is and how he is at work in the world around us and how we might live out our life in relationship with him? Uh, what are the ways in which we might become more diligent followers of Jesus as we walk through life day by day? Seek diligently Jesus Christ in this new year. We also notice that they worship extravagantly. As these wise men come into the presence of Mary and Jesus, perhaps Joseph as well, they open up to him their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. They, they bow down to worship him. And there's a real irony that's taking place in their worship of Jesus because, first of all, on the one hand, he's much less than what they expected. I'm sure that when they came to worship him, they expected to worship him, they expected to honor him in a big uh, palace, 
um, in a court uh, with many others who were coming to, to celebrate this new king and for them to come together in a small home for a peasant woman and a man and a child in very humble, ordinary circumstances. It must have been of great surprise to them. And yet they worship. They bring out their gifts. They're confident that this is the one, this is the king of the Jews that they need to worship. And so they bow down, they kneel down and worship him, and they give to him the gifts that they have brought, gifts that are worthy of a king born in a palace. So they worship extravagantly when they come into his presence. But I think there's also a piece of their worship in which they um, were looking for a human king. I don't think they understood the fullness of who Jesus was as he came into this world. And uh, so actually their worship means more than what they would have thought it was. Isn't it ironic that as they come into this place, Jesus appears to be less than what they had expected. But as they are worshiping and giving their gifts, they are actually worshiping more than what they could have even imagined. That in this child who has been born, that is there in front of them, this king of the Jews, it is really, truly God present in this world. It is Emmanuel. It is truly a king and God and sacrifice that has come. They worship extravagantly, not knowing exactly who it is or what it is that they worship. And they remind us, they call us to worship extravagantly as well. That when we come into the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, when we come together as the people of God, we're called upon to worship extravagantly, to worship with whatever we have, with everything that we have. Of course, the wise men came with their knowledge and their understanding of the stars and the prophecy. They came with their, their gold and their silver they came, and their, their gold and their frankincense and their myrrh. They came with their entourage. They came with everything that, that they needed for the journey, and they worshiped with what they had brought. So when we come into the presence of God, we worship with our, our time, our talents, our resources. We worship with, with who we are in the presence of God. We, we simply open ourselves up to him whether he is more or less than what we expected at any particular time, we come knowing who he is and we worship extravagantly in our bodies, in our hearts, in our minds, bringing everything into the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because he is worthy of all of our worship and praise. All of our songs this morning have, had, have dealt with who he is, the great, wonderful grace that he's given to us, the, the, the fact that he is worthy of all of our worship and praise, that he is king even though he is a small child come into this world. So we seek him diligently. We worship him extravagantly. And then we notice from the wise men that they obey completely. They obey completely. They've come, they've worshiped as they were called upon to do by the, the star and the prophecies. But then they receive a dream. <clears throat> and the dream calls them to, to not go back to King Herod, but to go back to their own country by another way. And they obey the dream. I suppose magi who are used to, to um, these indirect methods of communication from, uh, from the heavenly beings probably take dreams seriously as well. And so when they received a dream that they should not go back to King Herod, they obeyed and went back to their home country another way, the passage tells us. But think about what that meant. It wasn't just three men on camels who could quickly slip away out of the country. They probably had a whole entourage with them. That would be very, they would move perhaps slowly down the roads and would be very easily spotted. And Herod had his people all over that particular land. He ruled quite a large region there. And yet they quietly slipped away, risking themselves, their lives, their goods, to not tell Herod where this child was. They were completely and fully obedient to the command that God gave to them, regardless of the risk that they faced. Obey completely. We come into the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We worship him as the one who has come into this world. We have, we have sought him, we worship him, but then we obey him. Looking at what is it that God wants to do in and through our lives. How is it that Jesus in this new year is calling us to live faithfully as his people, to serve him in the place where we are, to be his representatives in this world. We obey completely. As we come to understand the task before us, we obey completely. The wise men teach us how to come seeking, worshiping, and obeying this king that has come into our world. 
And so as we worship this morning, as we sing, as we kind of wrap up the Christmas season, we do so acknowledging who Jesus is, that he's worthy of all of our seeking, all of our worship, and our complete obedience. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for your son who's come into this world. We thank you for all the ways in which we are called to acknowledge who he is and to give you the praise and the glory. We thank you that he is worthy of our worship and praise, that he alone is God and that he has come into this world. And uh, we thank you that we can celebrate his presence here. We pray that as we journey into this new year that you would help us to seek him diligently, to worship him extravagantly, and to obey him completely. We want to follow Jesus Christ in every day that we walk in this, this life in this world, asking that you would guide and direct our steps and bless us as we seek to follow you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing, We Three Kings. kings of Orient are, bearing gifts we traverse afar, field and mountain, moor and mountain, following yonder star, oh, star of wonder, star of night, star The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. Go in peace.